Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. This is the APNIC products and services session. Um, I'm Anton Stradum. I'm director of the product development at APNIC, and I'm going to be the moderator today. Uh, we wanted to wait a little bit more for more people, but I think we just better get started. So, um, the session will have five presenters. Uh, we're going to start with a user experience update by Dale Roberts. He's our manager for digital customer experience, overseeing the whole user experience of all the product families at APNIC. And then we're going to have updates from our four product families. Some of you um, might have noticed a small shift in the content of the session that we've had over the years and the presenters that are up here presenting. Um, it probably is a reflection of the changes that we've made inside APNIC, um, some structural changes that we made, and I thought it might just be worth quickly running through the changes that we did on product management to add APNIC. If we rewind to 2018, um, we had a software team who developed features and, require, and, and um, yeah, basically features or new software based on requirements from various teams, mostly the services team, but sometimes people like Sanjay or Paul or even other teams, and software would be written according to that. Um, what we found with that was that we had some inconsistency in ownership, as we call it. Um, ownership would change depending on the feature, where it came from. Owners would be either with software or services or with both or with neither. And it was, it was a real problem for us and it was actually reflecting in the products that we were designing. So. We took a long, long, hard think about this and, and came up with product management uh, framework. It's nothing new, um, but it really did make a positive difference for us. Um, our product managers are really the owners of the products, needless to say. They own the product from start to finish, the vision of the product, the priorities, and the feature set of the products. So they really are the keepers of our product. Um, last year, um, well, before last year, what we found with just doing product management by itself was that the product manager wasn't getting the support that they were needing to actually get the product done. The other team still had their day jobs and they were, had different priorities and different goals. So the product manager was left frustrated that he couldn't actually develop his product. So last year what we decided to do was to dedicate, to create dedicated cross-functional teams. So we disbanded the software team and created three new teams um, with um, various functionality in them. So the product teams have developers in them, um, they have UX functionality, they have DevOps functionality, and they have representation from the other teams, services team, comms, um, and training. So these are truly cross-functional and mostly self-managed teams. And um, they support the product managers and the product managers own the products. This year we plan to add two more product teams. We are actually on in the process of onboarding the academy team, and we plan to add one more. So I think the, the, the updates that you will see today or hear from today is really a reflection of these product teams, um, the work that they've been doing the, uh, the last few months, and also the plans that the product managers have uh, looking forward. So just in that context. Okay, um, we are actually, these slides are not PowerPoint slides, they're actually embedded in Mentimeter, which is, Sonny's shaking his head, I think there's a potential for things to go wrong with this. <laughs> um, the presenters are actually going to use um, Mentimeter to try and get some feedback from the audience to make it more collaborative, so my job is to set it up, so let's see how this goes. I would ask you, audience to please log on to menti.com if you can with your mobile device or your laptop or whatever. And um, type in the passcode. Ooh. I'm not sure what that is. If somebody can access menti.com with that password, can you please raise your hand? I just want to see if you're actually in the system. Thank you, Jamie. Sanjaya. Lily, good. Um, all right, so start quiz. I'm gonna just give you a trivia question. That's so we can get this going. When I allocated the final slash eight blocks, 
um, which block was allocated to APNIC. It only gets harder from here. Ooh, there's a timer. Well done. It's indeed 103 slash 8. All right. Um, I think we run. I'll move forward. I want to introduce the first speaker then. I have actually introduced you already, Dale, um, to give us an update on UX. All right. Thank you very much, Anton. Um, pleased to have you all here today. We're going to talk about UX. So what is UX? Well, Anton has already given away. It is user experience, because a lot of people don't know the acronyms, so that is what UX actually stand for, this stands for. But what do we actually mean by experience? I think when people think of the word experience, they might be thinking of something like going and getting a massage, going skydiving, doing something wonderful like that. So we're not meaning at that level. So experience can be a bit of a funny word like that, but that's not obviously what we're looking to do here. Essentially, we're trying to avoid this. We're trying to avoid frustration when using our products and services. And they're mainly on sort of websites and online platforms. And we just want to avoid that frustration. We want you to be able to get from A to B really easily. So how a poor experience can, uh, user experience can happen is essentially at APNIC or any other organizations, we think this is awesome. We're going to do this product, this feature. We're going to change this. We're going to do that with it. But we don't actually consult anyone. We put it out, and then the end users are like, what is this? This doesn't make any sense to me. This doesn't actually work at the end when I'm actually using it. So it obviously leads to that frustration that we're actually trying to avoid here. So how can we actually avoid that? Um, we need to listen and learn from uh, the members and the community so we can make better, better products and services. We need to understand you, who you are, and how you work, and what your actual needs are, rather than just assuming they are what they are. Also, we need to understand how you use our products and any pain points you have. So what is a pain point? It's essentially when you run into that period of frustration. You might be going along and using a site or using a platform of ours, and then you just hit a snag, and you just don't know what to do at this point, and it's incredibly frustrating. We're trying to remove those roadblocks for you, but we need to understand what they are first. And of course, we need to ensure any new products or services actually meet your needs and expectations. Again, we just don't want to create something just because we think it's a good idea. We're not the end user. We need to ensure that it actually works for those who are using it. Right, so to do that, it does go, it's a two-way street here. We need to be able to work with members and community, the users at the end of this, to actually achieve that. Because otherwise, we're not going to be able to do it. So this sort of first little graphic here in the kind of blue over there is that this is representing us consulting, collaborating, understanding, working together to create better products and services. That leads on to us developing it, and we have a happy end user. We're happy, you're happy, all fantastic. So how can you help? And this is really important. There's also different ways you can do it. It can be quite you know, low level. And a low level of uh, one like this is we have a lot of little feedback and surveys on our actual sites, products, and services already. So if you see that and you have some feedback, whether it's positive, whether it's negative, or just some ideas you might have, please let us know through those. Um, I think it's really useful. You can kind of see them in the corner sometimes and think, ah, I'm not going to do that. But it's really quite useful for us to get that feedback. So that's an easy way. It's not a lot of time to use, so please consider doing that if you ever come across it. The other way you can help, um, you can take, a re take part in research uh, sessions at events. So in that, you can meet an APNIC staff member. Uh, you can chat about a product or service. Um, we might even get you to test a product or service. You don't need to prepare anything. You're pretty much mostly rewarded for taking part, so that's always really good. And you can actually do it right here at Apricot. Um, myself, uh, Lily, who's actually in the crowd here, wave there. We've got um, Raquel as well. And we're doing sort of user research and product research while we're here at Apricot. Um, so it's a really valuable thing to actually take part in, and you can actually sign up to do a session, which I'll show you right there, because that's how you do it. Go to the Apricot website, 
go to services at down to product research, and you can just sign up online to take part and talk to one of us about uh, the products and services we have at APNIC. Another way that you can help, and outside of the, the, um, the conferences and events, is joining the Community Insights Group. So essentially this is uh, a group that offers feedback to us on our products and services. You can join up really simply online. Um, there's apnic.net your say there, so you can go to that site. We'll have that obviously in the slides afterwards, or even search for Community Insights APNIC and you'll be able to come across it. Once you join that group, then we will send you out invitations to take part in different um, levels of research. It may be something really simple as a five second test. We actually do have five second tests. That's all it will actually take you to, to do some of the research we do, all the way up into these in-person conversations that we're doing here, for example, at Apricot. You choose what you take, get to take part in. You don't have to do everything. We're not going to spam you with loads of emails. But it's really useful to, to sign up to this to help us create those better services for you. Right, and then this is really important because often people give feedback and think, well, you know, nothing's going to actually happen from it. So this is our commitment for, um, from us to you, is that we will analyse your collective feedback and identify improvements that can be made. So it's really about collective feedback, and I think that's important. Just because maybe you, one person has a, an issue with one little part, but you know, hundreds of others have something else, we always try to look at the collective of that. Um, we'll also prioritise work based on how severe the problem is, um, also the time and resources. We obviously don't want to spend a hell of a lot of money, that, uh, of members' money, proving something that's only going to have a little bit of an impact. We want to make sure that actually has value um, for both on a financial and also on a usability level. And we will report back to you on the improvements that we make. And I think in a lot of the um, sessions that you'll hear from my esteemed colleagues, they will talk about how they've made improvements to products and services based on the feedback we've already received. All right, so now time, let's get some feedback. Let's have a bit of commitment here from this. So if, if you are on menti.com that you just signed up to before, um, if you could go there, this is asking how would you prefer to provide feedback? And I think you can actually select from more than one there. So would you want to do that in person, through a potentially an online video chat, just online chat, a survey email to you, or survey actually on the website you're using? Now we've got an in-person, online chat. Nice. Any more? E? No one wants to do online video. It is a bit weird sometimes, isn't it? Oh, there we go. We got one. <laughs> OK, awesome. That's great. We'll take that on board. That's actually really handy for us to know, because we obviously want to design some research and some surveys that are actually going to work and what you actually want to do with it. Right, I am going to move on to the next one. So thank you for that feedback. Right, also, I just mentioned the Community Insight Group. Can you let us know, are you already um, a member of it? Would you consider joining it? Yes, I'm definitely going to sign up. Yes, you're interested, but something you might actually forget to do, or you're not interested at all. A lot of people forget. <laughs> this will be our job to remind you after the event itself, because we want you to commit to doing it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Human behavior, so interesting. Right, we're going to definitely have to do some reminders after this, for sure. You can make a note of it now. Remember, it's uh, apnic.net, your say. All right, we'll move on. And last one, out of these services that we have at the moment, which of these do you think needs most improvement? A little controversial there. What do you think needs to uh, improve the most out of these? It's anonymous as well. We won't be offended. Oh, a bit there for my APNIC. Interesting. Andre, my APNIC, I think you got a bit of work there to do. <laughs> and who is as well. Everyone thinks the APNIC website is uh, obviously fantastic. <laughs> 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 
Okay, interesting, really interesting. Well, this, I think this just shows you how interesting feedback can be. We can make some assumptions about what some of these results would be, and I think I've already seen a couple of surprises there. So it's really important for us to get that feedback from you so we can actually take uh, the best actions going forward. All right, thanks very much. Thank you, Dale. Um, Next up is uh, Che. Um, oh, sorry, there's a question. Yes, Aftab Siddiqui, um, um, APNIC member. Um, I really like that you are taking feedback from the community, but I, I, I would just suggest one thing. Uh, don't consider it as the final community feedback. The numbers are not there yet. Um, there are a lot of people who haven't provided any feedback to it, so um, I would suggest opening it up to the uh, mailing list, sending it in uh, APNIC talk or something like that, um, or to the members' mail mails, uh, emails, so they can provide you more feedback. I mean, what I saw is pretty much what you get what I, with my experience, but it's still it's a good idea to get more experience, uh, more feedback from the community. Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, an amazing point. I think what we see here is not all the feedback we would collect and the only people we'd go out to. Yeah. Um, we would go out as far as possible um, to as many people as we can. We obviously even do, obviously, the APNIC survey, which is massive every two years. That's, that is what we would include as some kind of community feedback as well. On top of that, we look at a lot of data on that. We look at quantitative, we look at this qualitative stuff as well. So we try to go out as much as possible. We don't want to kind of make it as small. We try and go out as much. But we definitely need that kind of whichever platform or whichever group of people, that two-way street to get that feedback. So yeah, no, we're ready. That, we'll okay. take that on. Yeah, we are on the same page. That, no worries. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Hefter. Any other questions for Dale? All right, thanks, Dale. Our next speaker is Chai Yu Chen, Director of Infrastructure and Development. He's standing in for Peter Blee, our Product Manager for the Academy. Thanks, Chai. Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Chihu. Um, I'm actually uh, doing the updates for Peter Blee, uh, who is the uh, you know Academy Product Manager. Um, Uh, when I say uh, academy product, uh, it's in fact referred to, uh, you know, the online platform mainly. And, uh, you know, going forward, in fact, uh, you know, academy will cover, you know, a wider range, including the face-to-face -face training. Uh, we are, for the training, we are using the so-called blended learning approach. Uh, that would mean, like, uh, when people come to us for training, firstly, they would uh, come to us uh, for on the online platform to get the basic to intermediate level of training, and then afterwards, they will, uh, you know, uh, attend our face-to-face -face training for intermediate to advanced level training, and then maybe going back to the online platform for virtual labs and for, you know, other topics, and then come back again, so it's a blended uh, online and face with face training in order, you know, to give you the best, uh, you know, uh, training uh, and education. And, uh, you know, talk, you know uh, when we talk about the online part, in fact, we have like uh, three major components. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, academy.apnic.net or apnic.academy, uh, we have, you know, online courses. Uh, live webinars and virtual labs. I'll go through this uh, one by one. Um, online courses, is, uh, these are more formal courses. Um, you know, we are, you know, transforming gradually. Uh, you know, the latest uh, approach would be video-based training. All of these uh, will require people to, you know, uh, you know spend uh, uh, hours in, onto our training. And, um, you know, at the end, uh, we'll have quizzes. And after you have completed the quizzes successfully, you can get uh, the certificate of uh, achievement. And uh, of course, now we already have uh, quite a number of courses online, um, in f including you know the latest IPv6 uh, fundamentals that we launched last time at Chiang Mai. And uh, for other courses uh, which are not video-based, we are going to you know. Uh, migrated to the video base um, so that we can all have a like, consistent format. I'll tell you more 
why we you know, will use uh, the video format. Um, we also have a monthly live webinars. Um, you know, uh, we uh, had the so-called e-learning courses before we did like uh, three e-learning course, one hour, uh, like uh, uh, once every week. Uh, but we, our experience was not that good um, because the topics usually are like repeated and, um, and the participants sometimes would be as low as three or five you know, for you know, uh, effectiveness. Of course, that's not quite good. So we kind of replaced that e-learning with the live webinars. And now we would uh, pick some hot topics every time, every month. And then we ask subject matter experts uh, to do the uh, live webinars. Uh, you know, we did uh, you know, IPv6, RPKI uh, security topics before. And um, we actually um, find that you know, the outcome was actually quite good. Um, the record that we have, the uh, number of participants, uh, the most number of participants that we had uh, was 190. Uh, in fact, it's my webinar, uh, so I have the record. Uh, but uh, usually, we also we, we we will have like 60 to 70 people attended. So you, you can see the effectiveness of that live webinar. And our plan is, uh, you know, after the live part, we will put the recording online after you know proper editing, so that people who cannot uh, uh, join our live uh, webinars, uh, they can still you know look at the uh, recordings. And we will put it up on you know, our website as well as you know, um, uh, the training uh, major part. Um, and and w another very um, popular uh, function that we have on the platform is the virtual apps. Uh, our training is vendor neutral, but, when, uh, but people, of course, uh, when they learn about the technology, the knowledge, they want to do you know, uh, some hands-on. Uh, we have a cloud platform to help us to set up like uh, virtual routers, virtual switches, and even virtual route, uh, servers. And then uh, you know, we set up connection among these devices and then uh, ask uh, our you know, uh, users to you know, do proper configuration based on our uh, you know, uh, uh, lab instruction, and then they can, you know, make the network and also the, 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 the servers to talk, um, you know, properly. And so it achieved, of course, um, the, 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 uh, at least to demonstrate that they have learned uh, the knowledge properly through the courses. And it's another very popular function um, of the uh, Academy product. Um, the major reason why we uh, use video is because we, it's easier for us to do multilingual support. Uh, last time in Chiang Mai, we announced that we have launched the multilingual support. Um, so on the video, uh, the video will be in, in English, but then we'll have subtitles in different languages. Uh, and then uh, even the whole website, we have you know, uh, different languages. Right now, we support um, eight different languages, as you can see here, you know, if you know <laughs> what these are, uh, including like uh, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Indonesia, Japanese, Korean, Mongolian, uh, Thai, and Vietnamese. Uh, uh, based on the demand, we can add more you know, uh, uh, languages onto it. And um, last time we mentioned about it, uh, we, we mentioned uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a pilot uh, support. Uh, but now we want to declare it as a uh, production surface, uh, is Edurom. You know, Edurom is a uh, worldwide uh, Wi-Fi roaming uh, network, uh, you know, uh, covering more than 100 uh, economies. And um, so when you are a member with my APNIC accounts, using the same account to uh, uh, access uh, Academy, then you are eligible to use the same credential to uh, access the Edge network all around the world. Of course, it's mainly to cover 
um, you know, uh, so-called research and education uh, institutions. But in certain cases, including like airports, hospitals, libraries, they also provide edge ROM, and then you use the same credential to log in. That would mean that you can have Wi-Fi access in a lot of locations. Uh, this is now production. Uh, more information uh, is now put online. You can you know, follow the instruction to gain access. Uh, here is the, uh, the page that you can uh, refer to. And uh, regarding the growth of economy, uh, we uh, changed the platform uh, from Moodle to uh, Learn Dash over WordPress uh, one and a half years ago. And uh, before that, we had less than uh, 1,000 registered users, but now we have more than 5,000. So you can see more and more people are accessing uh, our academy for you know, online learning. And uh, these are the access. Uh, our platform is totally open, so we uh, have users from not just this region, but also from other regions. And some more updates. Um, like today, we have launched a new online course, which is IPv6 address planning. Uh, it you know uh, is covered around two hours of you know uh, learning, covering uh, different pro uh, topics, and uh, we uh, develop it in house. But we also use some external help, including our community trainers, and uh, all video based. Uh, now is just English, but we'll add other languages, um, you know, one by one, uh, so that you know people can access it uh, if they want to have uh, the access uh, using their own languages. Um, the upcoming online courses, we 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 would do uh, routing uh, next uh, within this year including, of course, the basics is a replacement of the existing course, um, and then we'll do OSPF, integrated ISIS, uh, BGP, and we also would do the Linux system administration, um, so that would cover a you know, wider range of like, uh, online training courses. Um, as I mentioned, this is you know, mainly to cover the basic to intermediate level of training, and for advanced training, um, yeah, I switched it already. Um, for advanced training, we still rely on our face-to-face -face training. Uh, this is a very important part of our like uh, blended learning approach. Um, so when people uh, you know gather enough basic learning, uh, basic knowledge, then um, you know uh, they are recommended to attend our advanced face-to-face -face training so that they can have a more solid um, knowledge and. Um, for the online platform, we you know, want to integrate our training.apnic.net website as well so that people don't need to you know, go through different uh, websites for you know, online training and face to training. We also want to you know, uh, uh, have better tracking of uh, our training uh, attendees, uh, no matter they are you know, going to our online training and um, our face to face training. So uh, more uh, functions, the features, integration will be up on the uh, Academy platform. And wow, people have already provided inputs. Um, yeah, which function of AP Academy is of the highest value to you? Uh, it's, yeah, it's quite expected. <laughs> because you know, virtual labs is for people to practice uh, their knowledge. They can set up a, a virtual network, um, virtual servers to, you know, um, practice what they have uh, uh, acquired. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, in fact, it's quite, you know, this is what we expected. And we will continue to, to develop uh, more virtual labs on uh, the Academy platform. Okay, uh, enough for this. And then, uh, which training topic is of the highest importance to you? Uh, we just picked four. In fact, there are more, but we want to have a sense of, you know, what people would uh, love to have more, and then we will spend more resources to, you know, uh, develop uh, more courses. Oh. 
of course, as Stel mentioned, this is just you know you know, <laughs> one input from you guys. We will also, of course, gather you know inputs uh, through other methods. Uh, but yeah, as, as expected, <laughs> network and uh, routing security. Um, yeah, that's probably it. Uh, any questions, comments? No, then I'll hand it over back. Uh, one okay. question. I, after I'm thinking, a uh, member of the APNIC, don't put ice out there, please. Um, what's the uptake of other languages? You mean adding more languages? Or no, no, no. What's the, uh, do you have any statistics showing that uh, since you have added more languages, people have taken courses in these particular languages or not? Yeah, we have statistics. Okay, uh, so I mean, the, the uptake is good, no, not good. I mean, just trying to understand if it, it worth um, um, doing it or uh, it's, it's better to spend more uh, resources on doing it in English or not. Just trying to understand if it, it is good or not. Yeah, we, we, we have some statistics that okay. we, we can share with... Uh, uh, our members through different channel. But okay. yeah, we, we have just started it, so we are still gathering um, statistics. Okay, and is there any um, um, plan to add more languages? Yeah, we do have planned. Uh, I mean, the so reason. I say, <laughs> so that, I say that, 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 yeah, definitely we will add one more uh, at the next APN meeting. Yeah, that's all I can say. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Hi, Paul here. I just thought I'd mention in uh, response to AFTAB that um, uh, a good indication we've got of, uh, of the importance of, um, of non-English is the last APNIC survey which was offered in, I think, the same eight languages. And we got 31% of responses in non-English. So that was a pretty, pretty strong indication. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, our next speaker is Andre Geldenblom, product manager for the membership products. Andre. Um, hello, my name's Andre Geldenblom. I'm the product manager for the membership products team. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about what we actually do uh, in the um, product team. We, we basically de develop and deliver world-class products um, and services that's required by our members. And the type of products we have, the products that are internal to us are things like ARMS, which are the back-end process back processes that help manage the member accounts. Um, we also have my APNIC, which is more of the front-end side of things. Uh, we have APNIC login, we have mailing lists, we have application forms, and a lot of these um, deliver services like the voting service, um, the um, um, help desk inquiries, uh, contact management, resource requests, etc. Um, our role is to really understand uh, more about how our members interact with um, APNIC and to continually improve uh, the products and the services where we can. Um, the way we do this, Dale's probably covered most of it in his um, presentation, and um, that's to go out and speak to our members and understand more about what they, how they're going to use our systems and then look for the ways that we can improve. Um, that's pretty much what we do. There's a little bit of a grey area between exactly what a membership product is and a resource product. Um, that's where you get two different product teams, uh, such as the membership product team and the registry product team. Uh, I might explain a little bit la later about that in um, the MyPinic update. So what have we been doing recently? Um, you may have noticed, many of you, either to your delight or not, <laughs> that we have a new MyAPNIC front end. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of work being put into this. Um, the APNIC is sort of growing from just a tool uh, that allows you to manage your resources more into an engagement portal. Uh, we've opened it up more to the community as a whole, not just members. Uh, it allows us to uh, better engage with the community over time. It'll allow us to um, uh, introduce more self-service tools, more collaboration, 
uh, between our members, more collaboration between the community, uh, and also it gives us a platform that we can use to uh, let our members discover more of our products and services. Uh, this is uh, a new platform that we've built and there's not a lot of value yet, there's not a lot of tooling, there's not a lot of features yet, so we will come out to the community and we'll ask our members in the community and we'll get your input as to what's important to you and that will drive how this thing evolves over time. You would have also noticed that the resource management side of it is actually moved. Um, it's now accessible via MyAPNIC, um, but it's not the dominant uh, tool within MyAPNIC. Um, a lot of this is so that we can focus the tooling and uh, the resource management side and um, get a little bit better at it, uh, allow it to become more specialised. Um, we will be going out to the community, and as Dale mentioned earlier, there is, a, you can't see it in this slide, but there is a feedback button on all of these products. Uh, I'd really encourage people to please use those feedback buttons. Give us as much feedback as you can, even if it's negative. It doesn't really matter. We want both. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, what else? The other thing we've been working on is voting. Uh, the voting for this EC election has gone uh, full online. So no more paper ballots. Uh, we've built, uh, we've engaged a third party company called Big Pulse um, and they will be running the uh, election for us. What we then do is we integrate uh, my appendix into Big Pulse so that uh, we can allow you guys to access the, the voting platform. Uh, one of the benefits of uh, launching the new my appendix is we were able to roll this new voting feature out uh, in a matter of weeks rather than uh, months to quarters uh, in the past. So um, this is quite exciting for us in terms of um, being able to deliver features a lot quicker. Um, some stats on so far, um, I haven't, the voting's not finished, so these are uh, stats that will change. But um, you notice that uh, last year there was about uh, 826 members that voted, and so far as of a couple of hours ago, we've already had 780. So uh, that's quite promising. Um, and uh, we've mostly not had any issues, so that's been good. Uh, something else that we've been working on uh, over the last few months is the policy implementation for Prop 125. Uh, this was a lot harder than, um, than we expected. Uh, we got a lot of feedback from the community. Uh, there's difficulties navigating the system. Uh, the process is a bit too long. There were some bugs in that. Uh, and we have uh, looked at simplifying uh, as much as possible. We've um, removed the lockout from my appendix to ensure that um, people are able to still get their work done. Uh, and we'll continue to listen to the community as best we can uh, and, and improve the system as much as we can. But we do have to adhere to the policy requirements. Uh, if you want more information on this, uh, tomorrow there's a policy SIG at 9.30. Uh, there'll be a lot more detail about this particular uh, policy. Um, the other thing we've been doing is APNIC login. You, many of you would have noticed that APNIC login has been there since the Academy. I think the Academy was one of the first places to use it. Uh, and also everyone is currently, that would have come to the, reg uh, to the event, would have registered through APNIC login. Um, the, about a month ago we launched my APNIC and when we did that a whole bunch of new people started using APNIC login. And this produced lots and lots of questions. Uh, all sorts of things like, um, what happened to my old login? Uh, why is it still say beta? Those kind of stuff. Um, so I just want to explain a little bit about uh, where the problem, where APNIC login has come from. Uh, APNIC login was born because we had a problem before um, where everyone had to log in to all of our systems separately and none of these logins were interconnected. Um, so it was quite painful for the end user to have to go to each one of these systems log in again and again and again. And the problem was uh, sort of compounded because many times I'd go in and I'd log into these systems but they'd use a different email and a different um, login. And <clears throat> the problem with this is that we would lose sight of the true identity of the people we were interacting with. Uh, and we needed a better way for both the end users, our members, to come in and use our systems and for us to better identify and be able to engage with these people. So, what we've done is we introduced uh, APNIC login about uh, probably nearly a year and a half now, I'm not sure exactly when. Um, and 
what it's going to do is allow users to log in using only one single login, and that gives them access to all of the different uh, uh, products and services that we have. Uh, they don't have to log into each one separately. So the, the benefits are also that the, the experience is improved for both the, the end user as well as for us on um, being able to engage with our users and help you guys when, uh, when there's any problems. Uh, we actually know who we're talking to. Um, we are going to introduce better uh, identity management, so you'll notice over time um, things will change in the APNIC login, your profile, there'll be more, more ways to manage yourself and your own profile. Um, APNIC login is still in beta. Part of the reason for that is we still have a lot of systems that aren't part of this single sign-on, that aren't part of this um, uh, uh, APNIC login system yet. So as these systems come on board, we tend to get duplicate emails or duplicate profiles, um, and we're consolidating these uh, as they come online. Now, as some of you would have received phone calls or um, uh, emails from uh, the services um, guys, and they would have asked you where and how we can consolidate multiple logins. And so there might still be that happening over time. So you will notice uh, improvements and changes on APNIC login, and you will notice that it'll stay in beta for a while until we're able to get a lot of these systems online. So 2020 and beyond. A lot of the stuff that we're hoping we can release uh, within the next few months is the membership application form. Uh, we've done a lot of work on this over the last year. Um, we're hoping that we can have a beta release out by the end of Q1. In APNIC 48, we did a whole bunch of research and we got a lot of feedback from everyone. Uh, some of the feedback was the language is complicated, um, the, the, um, the writing is a bit technical and people didn't really understand it. We also managed to validate some of the assumptions that we had, which was the uh, save and come back. People really liked that so that they didn't have to fill the form in in one go. And the way they could save multiple forms. Uh, uploading documents towards the end was really useful uh, instead of after the submission. And just in general, the form was a lot clearer and cleaner. So um, this should roll out pretty soon. And I think the actual membership application process will be a lot smoother. Uh, we'll get a lot less uh, but sort of bogus applications and um, overall the new members will be a little bit more delighted. The other thing we've been working on is IPv4 transfer listing service. Um, this is an MVP release that we're hoping to do by Q2, MVP meaning a minimal viable product. Uh, the idea here is that um, we would like people to list uh, unused IPv IPv4 address space. Uh, and then that'll allow others to um, see, uh, access the contact details and then uh, facilitate communication. Now, we haven't validated yet that people will actually list on there. We've gone out, we've asked, we've uh, also understood that this has been a requirement, mostly from those wanting the address. So we've put a bit of energy and effort into it. We're ba building a basic listing service. If it proves that it's worth putting more money and more energy into and, and it's proved that people are going to use it, we will uh, spend a lot more time on it probably in the coming months. Um, the other thing we'll be working on, voting improvements. Uh, there's still a bit of work to be done there. Whatever we learn from this particular input, we will uh, do over the next few months. Um, we'll also be getting NRO uh, integration into Big Pulse uh, for, for APNIC 50. We have uh, contact management improvements coming up uh, in a few months. So this is an ongoing sort of rolling uh, update that we'll be doing. Um, with APNIC logging coming on board, it changes the way people understand uh, about the identity and their contacts. Uh, we would like to make the user experience around this a lot more clearer. It's, uh, it's a little bit untidy at the moment, a little bit unclear. Uh, and this needs to go across many of our products, it's not just APNIC, so we'll be working with the other product managers to ensure that uh, contact management is, is uh, uh, high up on our list. Uh, we have a, quite a big project coming up um, that we've been asked to look into, and uh, it, what we're trying to do is develop an online collaboration platform. Um, the idea here is that people will be able to, our community, our members will be able to get together on uh, this platform and be able to share knowledge. Uh, a lot of the knowledge will be shared in specific areas. So for example, NEDOX, 
uh, engineers will be able to talk about various aspects of NetOx or um, Dash or you know any of those products like that. Um, they might also be able to share knowledge around some of the courses that in the academy. Um, this is really just going out and, and understanding the problem and understanding whether this is a, a need. Also want, wanting to um, um, validate that uh, the type of system we put in place is actually going to be useful for the people that we do it for. Um, so we'll really only be starting this in Q2 uh, and hopefully we'll be able to give you a progress report uh, in a, at APNIC 5050. Uh, APNIC 50. Um, that is it from me. I, oh, thank you very much. If you guys can please, as Dale mentioned, give us as much feedback as you can. Positive, negative, all of it. It all matters. It all helps. Um, product research Lily and um, Ra Raquel. Um, so the question I have is, if APNIC provided a tool that allowed for online collaboration and exchange of ideas, would you use it? Maybe. <laughs> cool, maybe it's better than no. Awesome, that's, that's, that's good, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, that's my update. <coughs> Thank you, Andre. Um, any questions for Andre? Hi, um, this is Yoshinobu Matsuzaki from um, IIJ. Um, so the, in the previous uh, talk from Chefu, uh, now we can use the uh, um, EduRoam by using our, our APNIC account, uh, APNIC login. Yeah. But uh, my existing account is just an, my username. Yeah. So I need to change it into the email style somehow. Is there any proper uh, way or procedure to change my account name well, on APNIC login? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I can explain afterwards. Or, um, we've, got, we've basically got a tool that allows you to link. Uh, when you log in, you can link your accounts. Also, your current email address will already be, you already be able, should already be able to use it. And if you can't, you should be able to just uh, contact Help Desk and we'll be able to switch it over. So if you've got it, if you've been using a username, um, that username is always going to be attached to an email address and you will be able to start using that email address. There are cases where you, we may encounter a duplicate uh, and Help Desk have a process to work through that for you guys. So uh, it's all in place. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Andre. Our next speaker is our one and only Sophia, um, talking about her information service products. Hello. Good afternoon. How's the energy level in the room? Everything, everyone is so quiet. It's so hard to come in front of everyone while everyone is like silent and... Shall I ask everyone to stand up? Yes. Stand up, please. Only the stenographers can stay on their chairs. Ah, oh, well, no, I didn't prepare any music, but yeah, a bit of stretch. Moving your arms, look. We even have the ops team over there helping as well. I like this energy much better. Thanks a lot, everyone. You can sit down again. Thanks. Yeah, a round of applause for you. So, yes, I am the one and only Sophia around. <laughs> um, and I'm curious, who in the room knows about the information services product family? <coughs> I'm glad to see my colleagues know about it. But, well, some of my colleagues don't. No one else? Information services product family? Mass, thanks. That's good. I see a few hands, but I'm happy that I included some slides to introduce you to the family because it doesn't seem to be that popular out there. So basically, the information services product family um, has, has three products. The internet directory, Dash, the dashboard for autonomous system health, and NetOx, which Andre mentioned, network operators toolbox. The internet directory, you can scan a QR code. I know Jamie will hate me, but you can trust me on that one. Um, it will take you to directory.apinic.net. 
It's a portal that provides information on how internet resources have been distributed by APNIC and how they are being used in the Asia Pacific region. There's a few main features there that instead of just listing them, I thought it was better to show you some screenshots. So that's what you will first see, and it's a general summary of the three types of resources that APNIC manages, ASNs, IPv4, IPv6, and how they have been distributed to the different sub-regions of the Asia-Pacific region. But if you click on those charts, you can actually um, zoom into the sub-region and into the year and see uh, per month charts and uh, for that specific sub-region, the different economies. We also have a map view that shows uh, the cumulative number of resources, ASN, IPv4, or IPv6, for the different economies in a sub-region. Um, still about delegations. But we also have incorporated from APNIC Labs information about IPv6 deployment. So you can get some charts showing how IPv6 has been deployed in the whole region or in specific economies or in uh, some of the, or in the sub-regions. You may be familiar with Visas, uh, the tool that shows diagrams with uh, how the autonomous systems are interconnected for an economy. This used to be a standalone website. We now have incorporated into uh, the internet directory. And the good news is that recently it became a web component as well. So something good about the internet directory is that now all of the charts offered there are web components. So you can download an embed tag, as we call it, and you can embed these charts if you have a website and you want to show, for example, in your economy how autonomous systems are interconnected, you can embed these charts. In, um, in your web page. We have used it, for example, for blogs. Sometimes we blog about something that has happened in the region, and we embed these charts from the internet directory. Um, another quite new feature is the ability to compare different economies, different sub-regions. So you can enable comparison mode, and in this case, for the example I'm showing, IPv6 deployment for different economies being um, compared. In this case, Australia and New Zealand. And that was the internet directory. As I mentioned, we also have a couple of um, other products. Dashboard for Autonomous System Health. Um, that QR code will take you to dash.apnic.net. It is a dashboard for resource holders. So you have to be a member of LACNIC and hold resources because this will give you information about your resources, the IP addresses that you manage. Um, at this stage, we are offering information about suspicious traffic that sensors of our HoneyNet have, been, have seen, have received from, from your network. Um, but it's currently a prototype, and we are exploring some more features. We are currently just, uh, just showing SSH attacks, but the idea is to incorporate other types of suspicious traffic and other features that I'll tell you um, in a few minutes about. So, um, yeah, basically you can monitor suspicious traffic coming out of your network. You can compare, there's some aggregated figures for the economy where the autonomous system you manage is and the sub-region that economy belongs to and see how that has changed compared to the month before, whether you're getting better or the economy is getting better um, or worse, or there's more suspicious traffic coming out of, of networks there. You can also see a percentage of the routed space from, from that AS um, and how, what's the percentage that has been seen sending uh, suspicious traffic and a list of prefixes from which we've seen that suspicious traffic. So those are, well, the, 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 main, the main features, as I mentioned. Uh, the other important one is down, the ability to download a report. So if, if you, for example, want to share with your colleagues or um, for any other reporting reason, you can get a PDF version of what you can see in the portal. Finally, the Network Operators Toolbox, NetOx. That QR code will take you to netox.apnic.net in case you don't want to scan the QR code. You can enter yourself. Um, this is a set of tools for network operators that gives information about networks. It can be about your own network, about other networks that you may want to connect to, and there may be other use cases uh, that, that you have for NetOx. I'm curious about those. We're working in collaboration with the RIPE NCC. If you're familiar with RIPEstat, you will see that NetOx is the APNIC version of RIPEstat. Uh, so it has an APNIC look and feel. 
It has better performance because we've put uh, things in the cloud, so for accessing it uh, from the Asia-Pacific region, the performance should be much better than if you're accessing RIPESTAT. But also we've built some additional widgets. So we had identified some needs, and so we have built our own. So not only you will find the RIPESTAT widgets, but also the, the new APNIC widgets. This is how it looks when you go to netox.apnic.net. You can enter either an autonomous system or IPv6 prefix or an IPv4 prefix and get uh, different tabs with different information. So at a glance has the um, most important or, or, or most useful information. Um, as you can see, there's the overview and routing status that's from RIPESTAT, but there's also a couple of new widgets that we developed and I have specific slides for those. We also created a new section that is um, from a project we had last year at APNIC in our activity plan. It was originally called Resource um, RQA, Resource Quality Assurance, but then we were like, we cannot assure the quality of resources. Let's not overcommit here because we just want to give you information so that you can assess the quality of resources. You can check this information, but we can assure, cannot assure anything. So. You can get information about whether resources are being routed and uh, how they have been routed in the past. You can get the who is matches for the resources. Uh, also some information about geolocation, current geolocation for the resources and historical geolocation. And we recently incorporated the uh, transfer history widget that is based on the APNIC transfer log, but just makes it easy for you to see um, transfer transactions that the resource has been involved in. So basically this will give you, ah oh well I forgot about the last one, black, uh, blacklist entries so you can check whether a prefix has been blacklisted. Um, so as I said, this is a set of widgets that will give you information about the quality. For example, if you're about to receive a transfer of an IP prefix, you may want to check whether it's still being routed, whether it has been blacklisted to get an idea of the, of the quality of that prefix. As I mentioned, we've been working on some new widgets. One is uh, from Kaira's AS relationships data set. So Kaira does an, an inference on whether AS relationships are peering or provided to customer relationships, and we are consuming their data to easily, um, for you to easily see for a specific autonomous system who are the peers, who are the providers. So this is available when you query for an autonomous system, and it's under the At A Glance tab. Another widget we developed is the Point of Contact widget. Um, this, this was an interesting one because it came from user research that we were doing general interviews about network operations, and um, something that kept coming, up, kept coming up is that the de facto um, place to look for points of contact when dealing with a routing issue is not WHOIS. WHOIS is not meant to be for that. The points of contact in WHOIS are, uh, for example, the person who requests resources at an organization, but they are not necessarily the team that deals with BGP. So if you're dealing with a routing issue, uh, the de facto place to go to, uh, to get a point of contact is Peering DB. So we were like, okay, let's enrich uh, the WHOIS data of points of contact, also adding Peering DB points of contact. So this widget, you can query for a resource and uh, get points of contact both from Peering DB and from WHOIS. Then IRR Explorer is also consuming an external source of data. IRR Explorer has a web page, but it also offers an API. So we are consuming that API and uh, offering just a summarized version of it. So you can query for an AS or for a prefix and get information about consistency between BGP and I IRR objects, so route objects, and also between BGP and RPKI. We also have an abuse contact finder. One of the things we identified when we started collaborating with RIPESTAT is that they had a, an, abuse, um, an abuse contact widget that was querying the RIPE database. So if you queried for a, a resource managed by APNIC, you would get this resource is not uh, managed by the RIPE NCC, so there's no information for it. And because we wanted to offer this service for the Asia Pacific, um, we developed our own widget that, because it uses RDAP, 
it offers um, information for any resource. It doesn't matter which RIR manages it. So it's basically the abuse point of, point of contact from who is, but you can get it from this interface. Um, finally, as I mentioned, the transfer history widget uh, consumes the transfer log, the APNIC transfer log, and um, it's under the RQC tab and shows the different transfer transactions a prefix may have been involved in, or an AS. Um, as Dale mentioned, we are doing more and more user research, and I wanted to show that we heard you. So for now, a few, I think this is the third or the fourth uh, conference that we are doing user research. Um, last time at APIN in, in Thailand, APNIC 48, we were doing some research, some user research for the internet directory. We had some interviews with people under the hypothesis that if we were able to clearly define what the unique value proposition for the internet directory was, we would be um, able to better promote it. But then, and it may sound obvious, but we needed to do the user research to learn it, we learned that there's already like a good number of new users coming to the product, but the problem is that the interface is not intuitive, so if they don't know exactly what they are looking for, there's a lot of value they were not getting from the product. So we kind of pivot in, in, in the direction of improvement for this product. And so we are now um, exploring, and I will talk a bit more about it and what we're currently working on, but um, we're, we're trying to make it easier for users to navigate the site and get the most value from it. Another thing we were doing last, uh, in the last conference was validating the idea of offering a digital collaborative platform, as, and as Andre mentioned, we will be working on that this year. Also for Dash, as I mentioned, it's still a prototype. Last time we were having interviews to understand um, behaviors and motivations uh, of network operators when dealing with different security incidents, and we were able to come up with a user journey and understand better how that works, and we were able to identify some pain points. So basically, the result of the, um, the main result, it was an, a report with a lot of interesting insights, but uh, a summary is this user journey. We were able to identify two groups of users. There's a group of users that has a good ex experience when dealing with network um, security incidents, and they have good budget for tools, they have a lot of experience, they have a good security team, but then there's also a group that I tend to think that is smaller ISPs, they don't have that much budget for tools, and they have a lot of pain points. And one of the main pain points, uh, or one of the main things that keeps coming up is they don't have access to complete information to deal with that incident. So what are we currently busy with? For the internet directory, as I said, based on what we learned last time, we pivoted and we are now proposing a new information architecture for, the, uh, for this product. So we're doing user research. We've had a few sessions already. There may still be some time slots, so if you're um, interested, you can go to where both Dale and Andre showed you, but I, I don't have a screenshot, but I think you already got that part. So under the Apricot webpage under services, you can find product research, um, and you can schedule a time slot. So basically what we are doing now is a comparative uh, usability test, trying to test whether the new prototype is uh, actually offers a better experience and is more intuitive to, to navigate. Um, and of course, we're also, also working on continuous improvement. So any feedback you have, if you have used the internet directory, is mostly welcome. Then for Dash, as I said, we were able to identify some pain points. We also have a survey. It's a kind of a general survey trying to understand the value of some features. If you want to participate, you're more than welcome. But also, we are running some user research this week as well. So you can also book a time slot for that one. We have a couple of ideas that we are testing. Uh, so based on the lack of information and easily getting that information um, and, and the, those pain points that I mentioned we identified, we are testing a feature um, to offer custom alerts to users so that you can set up, for example, a threshold for the um, suspicious traffic coming out of your network and if it gets to that threshold, you receive an email. Um, but also because um, of all the work we've been doing in RPKI and BGP routing security, we are also exploring adding, and this is information that we have, uh, I think, as part of route management, but it would make sense to maybe 
also offer it through Dash um, in a different way. So we are testing some wireframes with this idea as well, uh, offering information about routing inconsistencies between BGP and RPKI uh, and, and route objects that may help identify potential BGP hijacks. Finally, Netox, we didn't have time for, we didn't have enough time slots to do user research during this conference, so we, you will probably hear from us for the next APNIC conference. But basically, some questions that we are now trying to um, understand better is like, do, user, do, do people in the APNIC community use RIPESTAT? Are they aware of Netox? What are the, the widgets you use the most? Um, what are the use cases? So maybe if we can understand how you use Netox, we can make it easier for you, try to improve the flow, the, the, the widgets that you use the most, we can make, it, make them more accessible maybe. Um, so that, those are some, um, I'm, I'm start thinking about them because I have some of the interactive questions about that. Um, also coming soon, we will work on a localization pilot. So aligned with the idea of the Academy of offering multiple languages, we want to explore uh, whether it would be worth investing in doing something similar for NetOx. So we will start with only one language and with some, we already have some metrics as a baseline of the current usage and, and from the different economies in the region. And we want to test with this pilot whether that Im Im improves um, and makes it better for, um, for users from other economies. So as I said, um, I have some questions for you. I hope you still have the energy after standing up. I hope you don't expect me to make you stand up again. Um, so please, if you go to your phones, I would like to hear from you on which are the products that you see more value in of the three that I mentioned. Ooh. Only six people? Do you really want me to make you stand up again? So you wake up, <laughs> shake your phone. Is it still there with you? The you know, that's good feedback. Next time I will prepare music and I will have elevator music uh, for the questions so people get inspired. Well, that, that looks a bit better. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as I said, I'm curious about who uses, well, if uh, there are people in the room who use Ripestat, Netox. No? So many no's. Well, I, okay, I, I, will, I will think that maybe you're not network operators, you just don't care about Netox. Well, if you're not a network operator, you don't need to care, right? Some people could be curious. Well, okay, we'll do more promotion. Um, what are your favorite widgets? So for those who said yes, um, oh, sorry. So you can cheat because I mentioned some widgets. So even if you don't use Netox and you don't use RipeStat, what widgets can you remember? I shared some screenshots with the widgets from RipeStat, but I also shared about the widgets that we have developed. Do you remember any? Oh, BGP is a popular one. That's not a widget. <laughs> BGP.hurricaneelectric.net. Points of contact, cool. Anyone else? Okay, last question. Those of you who do use Netox and who do use widgets, I know this is a hard one. What would you use them for? And it's a hard one to summarize, I know. Okay, I won't insist on that one. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks for standing up and for the energy of the room. Any questions? I'm so clear, I explained everything so well. Um, I even shared our plans for the rest of the year. No questions. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, our final speaker is George Michelson. George is our product manager for our registry products. George.
Hi everyone, I've got the unenviable spot of standing between you and coffee break. So let's see if my 200 slides go down well. So I'm here to talk about registry and the related products and I like to call this the core registry function. It's about the management of the internet number resources that we have responsibility for. And it's the classic triplet, the who, the what, the when. Who has this resource been delegated to? What is the resource that they have? And when did they get it? There's the subsidiary question, what policy applies to that delegation? So all of these resources, the INR, we hold them in constructs we call pools. And we mark out within a pool that resources are with a particular holder in something we call an event log. It's a construct of data that's become enormously powerful, widely used in the world for recording things that align with that sense of who, what, when. It's an ordered sequence of changes, they're the events, and you have this situation that if you take the prior state of the system and you apply an event, you get the current state of the system for all the prior events. And with that, if you get a new event and you apply the event, you get the new state of the system. So it's kind of like a causal chain recording things. So why do we say related products? Well, the relationship here is that because we've done that transactional record, who has what, we can now say because some who, that's X, has some resource, that's Y, they can manage this thing, reverse DNS, RD, RDAP, RPKI. So because they have the delegation, the relationship is we can offer the extra services. And those related products and services are RDAP, RPKI, who is in the IRR, and the reverse DNS function. So our general intent is to try and keep RDAP and who is as closely aligned as possible. We're going to talk a little bit about that later, maybe. Because of the complex structure of policy management in the APNIC region, because we have NIRs, some of these related products actually include activities that are operated by other people. So, what's our goals for core registry in 2020? Well, we have a strong focus on the triplet of correctness, completeness, and consistency. This is very, very important work for us to try and make sure that the registry is integral and accurate and completes all the statements of all the resources we have duty of care for. We have in the back of our mind that as we change the way we do data processing in APNIC, we may incur a burden of having to do new work. For instance, we're undertaking some structural reconsideration of how we manage our member records. And although you would say, well, that doesn't really relate to the registry, it actually does because it involves change of account and record keeping about the who part of who has what. So we actually have to think about this quite a lot in terms of the impact on registry. So we have got a body of work focused in the NIR, which is looking at the historical transactions that took place. We actually completed last year a significant amount of work with KRNIC reviewing this data. And that activity led to a sharing of our information about our belief in the state of resources in CNIC, JPNIC, and TWNIC, which has in turn led to some work we're going to conduct this year. This year, the primary focus, apart from that prior work in 2019, is the ASN records. And the reason is that our traditional registry process was to allow the NIR to have complete management authority over a block of AS numbers. And unfortunately, we didn't talk to them about how to capture back into central registry the transactions they performed. So we've been working with them to get that data and also working on bulk update methods to allow the NIR to tell us that detail of historical data. 
We're actually also going to have to change some tools for them later in the year to allow them to conduct direct allocations. This is a process that already exists for IPv4 and IPv6 records, and we're going to extend the functionality to include the AS numbers. So something happened in our systems, which means we actually now have to go back and conduct something we're calling a reversion. We had some updates applied, which are factually correct in terms of the who has what, but unfortunately, the way the tool was designed, it got the when part wrong. And that's just a mistake. The tool allowed a mistake to enter registry. So in simple thinking, if you're kind of doing household accounts, you can happily go into your book of spend and you can use the eraser on the end of your pencil. You could rub out the things you got wrong, change that six into a nine, maybe add $100 extra for the whiskey fund. You can make these changes. But in registry, we just, we just can't do that. It's our abiding principle. We never erase things done. So our sense of implementation is that a reversion is actually recording, no, that was a mistake, but it happened. So we're going to be able to say, up until this time, we've been telling you this happened, but we've been told it was a mistake, and now we can tell you it wasn't meant to happen. And we will then apply the correct transaction, but it means when we consider what happened in registry, we're not lying to ourselves. We're not pretending that we don't know a mistake has been made. We're putting into our event sequence an explicit recognition that we have a record of a correction. And we really strongly believe reversions will always be visible in our internal transaction logging system. So we have about 1,200 updates that have been incorrectly tagged in time. And the consequence of this is that for some interval of time, our transfer logs and our delegated stats have included incorrect dates. And there is going to be publicly visible change in transfer log because we're going to be showing the corrected states in that summary. And we're doing this work very carefully to make sure when we commit and public, publish that change, we can actually show anyone who asks and explain the sequence of events that took place. So we have some stretch goals that we'd like to do in 2020. They're much more firmer in intent in 2021, but it's nice to have an idea we might get on top of things and get to do this in the year. And one of these is to take that event log and actually produce something that we would call a ledger which is a more formal construct around what happened in the day. But this has quite significant implications for our workflow. We are not yet proposing that this is a public ledger. We're talking about an internal view that will be maintained. But there is a sense that there's a possibility for us to expose mechanistic changes in a day and actually allow people to see the transactional changes in a day in our systems. We are also looking into the production of the delegated statistics files. They're called delegated and delegated extended, and looking at ways that they can have a more direct production path from registry. Currently, they pass through an indirect mechanism, and we would like to have that improved, mainly because we need to ensure alignment with AS0 and our improved services with the registration services staff. So RDAP. We've been working most of 2019 and in this front part of 2020 on the idea of RDAP for the NIR. And this is a redeployment of our RDAP service into Google Cloud, and it's very, very nearly ready for release. So the current service that is homed inside Brisbane is handling about 50 queries a second regularly, and it has an occasional peak. It's actually a daily peak of around a thousand queries, but that service is running on our own premises. It's a single virtual machine. The new system, which is in final stage testing, we've already operated over a weekend soak test, 500 queries per second sustained load. So we know it can handle 10 times the current seen load. And we've also tested a spike that was 
three times larger than the largest spike load we have ever seen. Part of the reason we want to do this deployment is that we are also including a significantly higher level of monitoring and reporting to this system. Because taking something out of your own on-premises equipment and doing a cloud deployment puts a barrier between you and the machine. And you need many, many more points of instrumentation. This actually parallels a request that has been coming down, filtering down through the company from the EC, that we should be much more conscious of opportunities to measure and monitor our own performance and our own services as part of a, re a reporting line on what we're doing. So the expectation is that in this first quarter we will be doing an initial deployment to Sydney, but we have a second goal of doing a deployment later in the year, probably to Tokyo, but possibly somewhere else, and this is expected to deliver a significant improvement in the round trip time, the resiliency of this service. Our stretch goals in RDAP, well, we might do some improvements in the deployment. It's a very complex engine. It has more moving parts than is sensible. But to construct a simpler model, we'd have to do a re-architect. If the cost benefits are clear, we could do more points of deployment. One of the things that is in RDAP is that it's capable of representing non-Western alphabets much more clearly. And in particular, you can have a record in English and in a local script. And we've been talking with our NIR relationships to understand how we could capture the data that many of the NIR have in their own language. VNIC, for instance, have a really high level of data about the location of their resources in Vietnamese script. And it would be lovely if we could capture that information, bring it back into central registry, integrate it into RDAP, and publish a record with both because this would allow us to explore the idea that we offer that capability visibly, that if you are from outside the Vietnamese language community, you see English, but when your browser says you can read Vietnamese, you see Vietnamese. We're also exploring differenti differentiated service models, and the reason for this is that we have much stronger awareness of the necessary to respect privacy. A lot of the data in WHOIS and RDAP actually reflects individuals, and we would like to be clearer that we have some duty of care not to expose this all the time. But if you are involved in some kind of law enforcement or have a legitimate reason to say you need to see this data, we would like to get you to give us a credential, prove your identity, and we can then give you a higher level service of view. RPKI. Well, we have an activity called Resource Tagged Attestations, RTA. The idea is that you can do general assertions about your use of resources and couple it with a crypto signature. At the time being, this is on hold. The reason is that we actually haven't been able to take that body of work into wider acceptance in the RIR community. There are some concerns within the ARIN community. It has potential to breach their model of transactions that are permitted only through the member. And so we just don't want to do too much work and create too much tension of difference between the services we offer and the services available in the other RIR. But we have not, we have not in any sense forgotten the activity. We've just put this on hold. In the meantime, we're undertaking a UX review of the root management aspects of our activity in RPKI. We've actually been doing this at this meeting. I sat in on two of these, and they've been extremely informative of the confusion that can exist in people around the concepts in this area. We have an idea of an abstract routing model inside our systems. We ask you to tell us what you would like to be routed on your behalf, and we then create the route objects in WHOIS and the RPKI state. But we're getting an indication from the community. Our systems are very, very confusing. So the UX analysis is trying to understand how we could simplify language and concepts. We had a meeting earlier today talking about the future of WHOIS and routing security. And our goal here is really to try and find a way to get better convergence in these systems. But we're still working on that. So we also have a commitment we made to the community to implement Proposition 132, which is the AS0 for unallocated spaces. 
and our intent is to deploy by Q2 of this year. I actually have a lot more information I'll talk about later. But we have already gone into service with this. So we have a publication service, which is how we offer a service to people who use RPKI but host in their own systems, will publish on your behalf. And the idea here is to reduce the burden in the validators of the number of places that have to be talked to to fetch all the data. We've tested this with Krill, that's from NLNet Labs, and with Dragon. It has been deployed already for the NIRs. There are some minor issues with Krill business PKI that are being worked on. And we have also recently begun a collaboration with the RIPE NCC to explore resiliency in the RPKI systems. We're looking at trying to achieve some systematic improvements in the infrastructure behind RPKI. And we have undertaken a legal review internally of our CPS, but we are looking much more closely at our underlying operational practices in 2020. RIPE have made a significant investment and are reaching out for technical community relationships who could review their services in terms of penetration testing or code fuzzing or operational issues. And that's very, very interesting for us. So having leveraged a legal review, bilateral exchange, we're talking quite seriously about working with the RIPE NCC and hopefully other RIRs as well to try and improve resiliency in this space. Our stretch goals in RPKI, we'd like to take RRDP into the cloud and use the GCP system that we're deploying RDAP into. This would actually have almost immediate benefit in terms of improving our availability when validators come and fetch data. But it also would bring us to a comparable service level of the other RIR. RIPE are already using Amazon as the cloud provider, and Aaron have been using a cloud service for RRDP for some time. So this is an area where we may potentially be a weaker state than the other RIRs, and it's important that we come up to a comparable standard. But it's also important that we don't share fate. So although for instance, Aaron are using, I think, DigitalOcean as their cloud platform. We have a quite conscious sense we probably have to go to a different provider to make sure we haven't all collapsed down to a single point of failure. And of course, we're going to integrate the outcomes of the UX review. And if we find that we have managed to get on top of our backlog in RPKI, we are committed to going back into the RTA work. So, who is an IRR? We deployed the stub records. We no longer show holes when people search into who is. But we've kind of kicked off this conversation. And I stress, this is only a conversation. This is not a policy statement. And we are not trying to run in front of a community agreement. But we'd like to talk about the idea, could we think about deprecating who is? Could we separate out our IRR burden from our community reporting and delegation function and move the delegation record keeping into RDAP, which is something that is much more fit for purpose and is aligned with what happens in the domain space and is a globally connected service. It's even a single API spec which is implemented between all of the RIR. So it's, it's a, a better fit for what we're trying to do. But that kind of decision, saying let's stop doing who is, that's not going to happen overnight. That's a long, slow conversation with the community. But we thought we'd start the ball rolling and see if people wanted to talk about that. We will actually be doing maintenance work in who is in this year. We found some security holes that we're going to close. And we have had some consequence from cloud deployment for Whois, which has affected our logging, which has to be looked at. And we've also become aware that people who use the X509 public key mechanism need to have support for new algorithms included. So we have some update work there. Reverse DNS doesn't get a lot of activity from us because it's a remarkably stable service in the software space. But we have a proposition that's come to view for this meeting, Prop 130. It's looking at modifying v6 transfer, and it incurs a burden that if the transfers are into region, or even between us and the NIR, we have to be able to handle what we call fragments of the DNS. Now, we have a mechanism for doing fragment sharing, but that mechanism has only ever been used for IPv4. And it's easy for me to say I'm confident it will work for v6, 
but it's very hard for me to actually say that without speaking with the other RIR. And I actually can't obligate them to enter into that support in a timeline that aligns with our policy process. So necessarily, I'm being a little careful doing the internal staff review of this policy. I, I don't think there's a roadblock, but there's potential for activity in our area to support the necessary functions of reverse DNS if it passed. Um, AS0, Prop 132. I'm going to show all of these slides um, in the policy six. So I'm going to rush through this section because you really don't need to see this detail. The key point is that we're actually already running a test bed. So if I skip forward, yeah, the test bed is up and running. We have a live service published right now with a TAL, a trust anchor locator, and if you take this and you include this in a validator, and we have tested in Routinator from NLNet, and we have tested in Ripe version 3.1, it just works. It just works. It's absolutely fine. So we did some minor work to support this in Krill. We made a decision to deliberately use a clean system to implement this so it doesn't affect core registry services. And we had to change things because although we've all been saying, oh, there won't be very many of them, it turns out there are 60,000 holes, 60,000. The reason is there's about 250 objects in V4, but in V6, we implemented an allocation policy called sparse. It's a classic binary chop. So in V4, if you get block one, the next person probably gets block two next to it. But in V6, if you get block one, the next person get block 64,000 halfway up the field. We keep the space open as long as possible. But it means every delegation we make creates two holes. And we've done enough delegations, we've actually done a lot, there are now 64,000 holes in the V6 space. And every one of them becomes a rower object unless we collapse that data down. So we've added about three megabytes to the validator export state, and it's about 3,000 objects in total. Um, we used exactly the same logical structure as we do in the mainline system. It has a zero slash zero trust anchor, and it then has a production certificate that actually represents our real operating state. We're not currently using hardware-backed keys, and that does mean that there will be a requirement for everyone to rekey when this enters deployment. Um, it's based on the delegated file. It's a daily generation, but with a 10-minute cycle. Here's a view of a validator, and it's showing that we actually are live and reachable right now. So we'll be announcing this into the policy SIG and hope to see people testing this. Someone pointed out to me that I can't passively expect a result, so I'm going to reach out to community relationships and ask people to actually test this so that we know that it's working. Um, this is the product of what it looks like when it's running. This is the standard view of the validation state. That's my talk. Thank you. Any questions for George? No? Well, thank you very much, George. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you to all the presenters. Um, if there are no other questions, I think we can conclude the session. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and for participating and for having some fun. And um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.